So today we're here to talk about um, businesses that are fueled by mobile, that are fueled by apps. And um, we've got four panels here. So what we're going to do is, um, because we only have about a half hour, uh, I'm going to be uh, just a touch on the heavy-handed side of making sure we get through a lot of questions quickly. And so uh, I've already asked the permission to cut them off in a few minutes if that's uh, okay. And we'll say yes. So um, we'll keep it moving and lively here. Uh, what I wanted to do first is um, open it up to the panelists to uh, have them kind of give a brief explanation of you know, why they're here, what's the background, why, you know, what about their app and mobile makes them kind of an interesting perspective to share with you today. So my name is Chandler. Uh, I work for a local company called Craftsy. We're an online education and e-commerce company for creative enthusiasts. Uh, I joined Craftsy a few years ago after our Series B round, so I'm actually not a founder. Um, so worth calling out on an entrepreneur panel. Uh, but I've uh, been with the company for a while and was a, uh, a big piece of our early growth in mobile. Um, I think we're, we're mostly here today. We, we'll, we'll do something like uh, five to seven million uh, in revenue through our apps this year. Um, and mobile generally will be a big piece of the 50 plus million that we'll do as a company. So uh, we, we are out there making money on phones and tablets um, and glad to kind of talk about some of the tactics we use to do that. Hi, I'm Angus. Uh, started a company called Tag What. We were doing content delivery through mobile, uh, real time based, and built a platform to deliver from user to the person who would most likely, most likely want to receive that content. Um, transitioned into a company called Dear Local, which took the idea of mobile, but started utilizing a active audience somewhere else, meaning gaming like Facebook, so social advertising. Um, so this idea of mobile started driving a lot of traffic, and how do you get in front of people regardless of what they're doing? If it's in your app, that's one way, but if they're in another app, okay, how do we leverage that? So we became a very uh, optimized target Social Hi guys, my name is Devin Tavona. I'm a co-founder and CEO of a company called Panna. We are, Panna is a digital travel concierge for booking flights, hotels, cars, and food. We're a mobile only company. You download the app and you get introduced to Panna and she can book you flights, hotels, cars, food, all via a chat interface. Um, so kind of embracing a lot of uh, the paradigms that are kind of native to the way that the way that we use our phones. Um, I got here. Um, my, my background is actually in engineering. Um, I did engineering for a uh, textiles company called Everlayer that was part of my MapQuest in 2013. Um, worked on the Flipboard team that brought uh, Flipboard from iPad to iPhone, and uh, now I'm here. Yeah, I um, so I'm Jackie, and we're the CEO and founder of Rebel R, and we're slightly different in which we fall under human interaction, so we have both hardware and software. Uh, so our technology is a discrete wearable device that has the equipment interface and a keychain, utilizes lower energy Bluetooth to sync with our uh, smartphone app, and then that sends out the alerts um, to your loved ones in real time. So that's kind of a bit of background on myself. I'm non-technical, and I have to figure everything out as I went along. So if you're non-technical, Great. First, first question for the panel is, <clears throat> there's a common perception or belief that in the apps world, and specifically in the mobile world, uh, it's kind of a hits-based business. And so as you think about creating your businesses in this context of either it goes crazy or it doesn't do anything, how did you do that with your business? How do you work around that? What stories do you have about, about that reality for you? I can go. I don't have to go first the whole time. Uh, so I think the first thing I'd say there is mobile businesses, app businesses, to me, are no different than any other business. You need to be out there solving problems for customers, and when you do that, you build a business around it. Um, so I think that's the most important piece of this. In general, most startups are app-based businesses as well. So if you're not finding the growth, if you're not um, getting on some sort of rocket ship, uh, you're probably a little bit missing the boat whether it's app or not. Um, and we, we've built our business over time, but we have one um, really pivotal moment that I'll talk about later uh, that really changed who we were and what we were going to do. Um, and that was that was a very important insight for us as a business as we grew. Um, so that's a little bit of an unanswered your question, Zach. But um, I think uh, important to think about the business first, 
uh, the app comes second, and uh, from there you can kind of build out what you want. Yeah, I think it's right on. The, what I, how I describe it is if you're not solving a really itchy problem, that sounds gross, but it really is true. If your your customer isn't coming in every day and saying, well, are you done with the product yet? Then there's, you're not actually solving a problem. You probably don't have a business. Um, and it's a tough lesson to learn, um, but it's a good one. It's a good one to say, all right, if you've got 10 people lined up, then you've got something. If you have no one, it's just something awesome that puts smiles on people's faces. That's cool, but I don't know. Okay, I'm going to give the exact same non-answer. It, 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 it's a boom and bust business in only that startups are kind of a boom and bust business. I think back in 2009 or 2011, uh, just getting my feet featured by Apple would be enough to uh, kind of build a business around an app. It's no longer the case. Um, in fact, I think I saw a recent uh, post that um, an app developer published traffic statistics based on getting featured by Apple and getting featured on Product Hunt, and Product Hunt drove about 10x the traffic that, that an Apple feature did. So. Just as risky as a regular startup. Yes. Often, uh, mobile or apps businesses tend to be hit based, where it's either sort of all or nothing. I mean, you have huge hits, or you you have nothing. Uh, so, how do you think about that in the context of your business? Um, so, with our business, you have the app because you have a partner. Um, so, it's a little bit different for us. It's more like you get the hardware. question out. What, what were the important factors that um, made you embrace mobile or the distribution channel of apps? For us, so we're an online education platform, and uh, a lot of what we do is 
uh, built around uh, experience within the, the video that you're consuming. So asynchronous discussions, notes, uh, all these things that are added value to be more like a real classroom. Uh, it turned out it was really hard for us to do that on the web interface on phones um, and do it well. Uh, same was true on tablets. So we figured it out on desktops, but we couldn't really figure it out well uh, on the website on phones. And that was actually the impetus for all of our early apps, which is building a better video consumption experience for our best customers, continuing to prime that retention pump um, and keep our customers coming back and engaged and interested with us. We've since built out other things, but I think that was really the core of why we went into uh, the app space um, from the start was unique native features, kind of similar to what other people are talking about. Things that we can do much better um, on a native client than we can in a web system. So as you think about building your business and you, you think about the mobile space versus maybe some other approaches like desktop or uh, pure hardware, what's different about running a mobile business? What does it enable? What sucks about it? What are the challenges? How does it affect how you approach the market? I, I can talk about our two biggest challenges being a mobile business. Um, the first biggest challenge, uh, we launched first on iOS. Um, waiting seven to ten days to deploy new functionality is awful, um, especially when you deploy a bug. Um, the second challenge is that the onboarding and discovery flow of mobile um, isn't as baked as kind of the onboarding and discovery flow of SaaS businesses. Um, so if, if someone wants to find you as an app, first of all, like App Store SEO it really isn't a thing. People say it's a thing, it's not really a thing. <laughs> um, especially on Apple. Um, uh, so it, it, finding, finding a way to get discovered um, on either in the App Store is one route that you can go, or you need to figure out a way to get discovered on the web and then figure out a way to get users from your website to your app, which will always result in a conversion loss. So it's just going to be more expensive to get people into your app um, than it will be to get someone into your, your mobile SaaS product. Um, so that, that's, those are the two challenges for us. Um, on our end, our challenges have been predominantly technical with a safety product. It has to just be so consistent. Um, and so with Android, that was a lot easier for us to create than it was on iPhone because of, like he's saying, you know, you have to wait, you, there's all these different steps and processes, and then you don't even know if they're going to accept it. Um, and then the other piece was because we're safety, you know, having to design around 911 infrastructure and figuring out how are we going to help people use our technology to be really effective because we have we really have multiple customers. We have the person wearing our device and then their emergency contacts. So our app had to take into consideration not just the person who's wearing this device, but what is that process, what is that going to look like, that onboarding for their emergency contacts. And so for us, it was very the duality of what we were doing was very interdisciplinary and then understanding um, what would be those differences and those technical challenges for us. I think the biggest challenge for us, and this is one that's still there, is uh, acquisition and connection to the rest of the marketing world in the app space is terrible. Um, Branch, who spoke earlier, are doing some really good things in the space. Um, Apple has recently made some changes in how they uh, interpret URLs um, and how they think about that in iOS 9. Um, but even today, uh, apps are siloed, they're separate, and if you've built a marketing machine that understands uh, other elements on the web or how most of the uh, marketing happens in the digital world today, uh, apps don't connect in well. Um, so acquisition is really hard. Um, and whether you do it through the web and try and convert over later or go try and straight to, straight to app, it's just not as good. Um, and as that changes over time, maybe uh, there won't be a disadvantage there. But until then, I think for us, apps will always be a bottom of the funnel retention play. Um, and the best places to do acquisition are elsewhere. Great. Let's shift a little bit away from the specifics of, of apps and mobile and kind of true to our title here of startup stories. Um, can you share some of the stories with us? So we've got a lot of people potentially in the audience who are thinking about creating companies, diving into the startup world, the startup we where it's a big piece of this is learning from others. What are some of the stories that maybe one or two really prominent ones that stick out in your mind of like, boy, if I, if I have one or two things to share that really was painful for me and I could really save you a lot of hassle, what would those be? Mine is actually legal, <laughs> my advice, because I thought about this one. Um, I would have been an S-Corp first, because you can get your money back. 
Um, so if you're bootstrapping like I was, it's really good if you have a strong accountant. You want that because I remember thinking, wow, I wish I'd talked to an accountant first. Um, because in the beginning of starting a business, most of what you do is legal and paperwork. There's just a lot of it and it's expensive and there's a lot of steps and if you can save yourself that money, you'll be able to use that towards product development. And I wish that I had known that so I could have gone back and gotten you know, money in order to keep going. Um, so you know, it all worked out, but I remember looking back and being like, wow, like anybody who's starting a business, I would really suggest you talk to an accountant about ways that you can, if you're bootstrapping, how you can save yourself more. Can I do the opposite? Can I do a story that we, I think we did really well? Um, you learned from those two? Awesome. Uh, so, so one of the tactics that we um, deployed really, really, really on in our company life cycle, like, um, like three months into our company life cycle, is we built our MVP of our product on top of a platform called Parse. Are you guys familiar most, mostly with Parse? Parse, Facebook, um, mobile backend as a service. Um, Parse did a lot of things that you know you don't want to do as a developer. Ultimately, we've ripped out Parse, and you know we have a real, real mobile backend now. Um, but it did things like push notifications. It did things like um, database database storage. It did things like did things like offline caching um, and persistence of objects when you know you weren't connected to the network. All those types of things that would have taken forever to write as a emerging app business, we were able to deploy an MVP of our product in two and a half weeks. And so to have a product that we had an idea for and then have that out in the market um, with 150 beta testers using that product and giving us feedback, um, and it's actually the real experience that they're having, not like a paper prototype, um, that was um, incredible. And it allowed us to learn at, I think, a rate of like 10 or 20x of, of what we had, would have learned if we hadn't um, built on a platform like that. Um, by no means do I think that the, those platforms are good for scaling. Once we hit about 1,000 users, parse stopped working for us, um, and that's when we kind of migrated off. Um, but uh, that'd, be, that'd be a nice try. I'm going to go back to the time and resource budget management, all that stuff. Is when you're starting off, do you, you know, do you lay down the 20 Gs for your patent application, or do you just gut through it and you know build something great? Build something great. That's that's my do that, and then you'll come back up. But don't don't do that. That's that's my that's my opinion because you you build the product, keep going, and just you know push that forward. And then start thinking about your time. Your time is really important. So do you need to do all of your accounting? Do you need to do, every, do you need to, we were talking about ADP and payroll. Do you need to do that? Or can you hire a you know, Zen payroll that's three clicks? And it's like, ah, it's not as fancy, but it gets the job done. And then uh, you, know, you save yourself your time and your money, which are both extremely valuable, obviously. Okay. All right. So we're here for uh, Denver. We're here in uh, Denver Startup Week. and. Started week. So, why did you um, why did you build your business in Denver in the front range here? There's a lot of other communities we can go into. There's talk of you know which community is better. Is the one of the coasts better? Is the center of the country better? Uh, what are some of the pros and cons of, of starting and operating a business in, in Denver? I can go. Uh, so, we started our business in Boulder. Um, and recently moved to Denver um, about three months ago. Um, so I can talk about why we made the move. Um, partially it was because of cost of space um, in Boulder, but also uh, because of the, the talent pool um, in Denver. Um, especially uh, technical um, was a lot larger and we were finding that um, hiring was a lot easier if, if we had a Denver location. A lot of it uh, was a lifestyle choice as well. Um, loving Denver. Um, loved Boulder too, spent five years there, uh, but really loving Denver. As far as why we didn't move to a San Francisco or New York, which we absolutely could have done, um, I, 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 I think that, that moving to San Francisco to start a startup is a little bit like moving to LA to be an actress. Um, <laughs> being, being the new kid on the block and um, also trying to start a company wasn't you know, a challenge that we were interested in going through. Um, from a hiring perspective, you know, I got tons of different opinions on you know, should I hire in San Francisco, should I hire in Denver. Um, the salient point that I really resonated with um, was you know, in San Francisco, the talent pool is so competitive that you might hire and train an engineer and in 16 months they you know, have vested somewhat and so they leave you and um, you know, take all that institutional knowledge with them. Um, we found that we were able to hire extremely loyal, extremely happy people uh, here in the front range. And that's why we're here. I think another part of that question is around funding. 
and can you get enough here to kind of sustain your business? Um, we have great uh, investors in the area. Um, our investors who led our A, B, and C rounds, um, Foundry, are local. They're awesome. They're super engaged in everything we do. Um, and I think there's no question at this point that there's plenty of funding both here and that's willing to come in from elsewhere. Uh, people like Drive in Columbus or even the VCs out in uh, the Valley in New York and elsewhere that have no concerns or many, many less concerns than they might have five years ago uh, with investing in various places. Um, one of the fun found early story of ours is one of our seed investors, a guy named Michael Deering, um, who's a smart guy from the early eBay days. And uh, he convinced, had tried to convince for a long time our founders to move back to the Valley to start Craftsy. Um, and they refused, they wanted to stay here, they, they believed in the ecosystem here. Um, and he told us he'd never come visit, because why would he ever come to Colorado? Uh, he's been four times to come and see what we've done here and what we've built here, and has been astounded every time at how awesome the Denver community has become. So I think there's huge advantages. The big disadvantage for us is uh, we, we find the talent pool a little bit small and challenging over time. Um, there's not that many amazing, especially on the technical side, uh, developers, but we've recently had a ton of success recruiting in from the Valley. People who hate the cost of living out there, hate the environment, um, and are coming and looking for really awesome companies um, that they can come join, and Denver's one of the places they're looking. I'd also add that you can recruit in from other places other than the Valley. Uh, yeah. You can recruit in from DC, um, from New York. A bunch of people want, yeah, Boston, a bunch of people want to move to Colorado, um, and it's a great drive. My reason for moving to Colorado is I love rock climbing. <laughs> there, um, I wish I could say I like had the foresight to think it through and find out that there's this great entrepreneurial community, but in all reality, I had lived around the world, Mexico, Switzerland, Colorado at some point, Georgia, Florida, and uh, before my dad passed, I remember asking him, you know, like we were living in Switzerland at the time, and I was like, you know, of all the places we lived, which was your favorite? And he's like, you know, Mexico had its charm and Switzerland and all these other places, but we were happiest as a family in Colorado. Um, so I picked the place where I thought it was going to be the happiest, and there was mountains. So it worked out really, really well for us to, to move here um, because it's such a different culture from where I come from, and it was a, a very, very pleasant um, surprise. And so I've completely fallen in love. I've been here now going on my fourth year and have no intention of leaving. In fact, my mom and my sister moved out here this summer um, from Florida. So now we're all here. Yeah, I think it's accessibility. It's a component con, but mainly a pro in my mind. You have someone like David Cohen, you see him just walking down the street, and like in San Francisco, there'd be 3,000 people chasing him down the street <laughs> to just kind of get a coffee somewhere. So we have insane accessibility. And granted, the number of people you have access to is smaller compared to elsewhere, but you have access. So um, I think a lot of it's what you do with that access is, is getting in front of people who are smart as a lot of people, and then just seeing and working together. Because, you know, like we were talking earlier, with the 10 right people, you probably know every startup in your whole state. You, could, you know, and so it's, and you can't do that anywhere else. I think it's really powerful. All right, let's open it up for questions from the audience. We've got uh, about five, six minutes left. <clears throat> Uh, how much effort did you guys put in IP protection? Uh, or how could they So that was the first thing we did. Um, I think the IP landscape is very different for if you're just software. Um, I, I, it's my understanding that with just software, it's a lot trickier, um, and especially because you have to make everything public. But with our hardware is where we were able to solidify our IP around. Uh, so that was slightly different for us, but it, it was very important, and it's one of those things that it completely depends on who you talk to, but it never hurts. We've just started thinking about IP at Hanna, um, and it's actually for a different reason um, than you'd expect. Um, we're not at all worried about uh, defensibility. Um, if Kayak builds what we built, uh, we're screwed. <laughs> um, you know, there, there's, there's really no patent war that we're going to go to battle with with the amount of financial resources that we have. Um, we're actually uh, looking at um, uh, IP and, and um, uh, a couple of different patents um, in order to potentially increase exit valuation. Um, because when um, you go to sell a company, not that we're looking to do that anytime soon, um, there, there's really a bunch of different things that um, uh, an acquirer looks at. Um, and IP is one that's uh, typically um, often 
um, underlooked by um, founders. Um, so having an IP um, portfolio when um, you start talking to potential acquirers is, is an advantage that, that, that we're looking to um, gain within the next couple of years. Yes. I don't know, my investors were like, oh yeah, that's nice. <laughs> it wasn't really like something they were thinking about obsessively. They're big believers in like, just be best. You know, be the best, and that's our motto too. Um, but I forgot to mention trademarks. I was gonna say that's one thing I would nail down, trademarks. Um, just because your logo, your name, you don't want to lose that. So make sure that that's solidified if you're really set on it. And I change my name three times, like make sure you're ready. <laughs> Oh gosh, um, the first one was Roses. Uh, the second one was Fearless Solutions, which was too much of a mouthful and an SEO losing battle, but I didn't know what SEO was then, so I didn't know. Um, and then Revelar, it means to fly again in Spanish, which we really like the symbolism, um, but it also we own Revelar.com. So <laughs> that was a really big deal. I spent a lot of time playing on GoDaddy. <laughs> so. I think for us, if you look at our recent valuations, our IP is actually all in our classes. We have about 900. Um, classes that are two and a half hours each um, that we've shot and curated and kind of built out and uh, they're all in-house, right? We're, we're making them and producing them. Um, and that's the reason we get the premium valuations that we do uh, against our revenue numbers. Um, so if you were just looking at our revenue, we'd probably have half the valuation that we have in recent rounds. But when you then layer in a bunch of media-driven IP, it's more interesting potential outcome if you go the acquisition route um, or something like that that changes the value of your business. And if you're bootstrapping, I highly suggest doing a provisional first. It buys you, well, first do a patent search. <laughs> that really helps. Um, you want to check that out first. Uh, then, you know, provisional, um, before the provisional ends, you have to file for the PCT, which would allow you to nationalize around the world. Um, on the bright side, even though a provisional only buys you a year, the PCT buys you 30 months. And so we just had to re recently nationalize in a few countries, and we had to be really particular about which ones we picked. But there's definitely a strategy you can take, especially if you're bootstrapping, to save the different funds, because we were able to kind of postpone a lot of costs. Like with Canada, we like paid a smaller fee in order to give ourselves a whole other year to pay for it. So you know, it's little things like that that you can, if you have the right IP attorney, um, you can really find ways to, to buy yourself that time to get that funding around it. All right, another, another question? It seemed like uh, the localization data was really important. We talked about last group and this group as well. Um, besides just plugging in an SDK to, to pull that, if I, have, if I have an app with this localized data, this is the uh, device data, what are the ways of uh, gathering that data to feed to an advertiser or useful? Is it as simple as an SDK or is it something where I have to build like, a more tactical database to collect this? Let's say you said they buy coffee every week. How do you know that? How do you collect that? How do you implement that? Facebook. So you have you have third party providers and they have an insane amount of data. I mean, it's I, it's on our side. It's just it's creepy. It's really creepy. And they, it's something that no one knows is because Facebook has integrated their whole user base with three or four of the largest data companies in the world. These are things about mortgage information, credit card information. When you swipe your Safeway card, they have all that information. Um, and you're wondering who the hell is looking at this stuff? It's Facebook. It goes back into their system, and um, people like us. And, Advertisers with access to their account do it. So you can do it through Facebook with the boost post button. I wouldn't recommend it at all. Um, please don't actually, because you'll lose money. But if you, you, there are other tools that Facebook has to use, there are companies that can help you with it, and with five to ten dollars, it's incredible how much optimization and really minute target you can get to. So let other people do the work to, to a certain extent, get you started, and then you can get growing and get more creative after that. You only collect that data, like you're collecting that data from Max, I know all those things, and I want to feed it from you have, yeah, so if you have app user IDs, you can feed that back into Facebook, and so they, they'll find those users, which is really effective. Same with the email list. So you think of the, the coffee shop with the news with the email sign up next to their, coffee, their uh, POS that doesn't ever do anything. Now you can take that whole list, import it into Facebook, and they'll match to a match for you, and say, okay, here's all those people who said they want to hear from you, and now you can actually get to them through Facebook or you know, any other YouTube model. Really. All right, we got time for one more question. Again, for the legal, talk to a data privacy attorney. We know a bunch of good ones, but um, just make sure you understand that you're collecting the data legally. You know, 
for example, Fitbit recently was able to actually prove that somebody was not assaulted because of their data. And so, especially with our product, we have a lot of, we're going to be collecting a ton of data, but it's understanding how do you do that within reason and still respecting your customers, I think is really crucial. But yeah, it's, you can find anything about anybody nowadays. I used to do oppositional research for political candidates, and it's pretty creepy. <laughs> because as a safety product, there's a lot of legal, I, I didn't expect this to be such a legal conversation, but there's a lot. And you have to understand all the different pieces of it. Um, but it's mainly understanding that, like, I don't know if any of you guys watched Silicon Valley, but there's a moment where he's just talking, and he's like, I just want to build really cool products. And I feel that all the time. I, can't, I related to that moment in that show so deeply, because it's like you have to, follow all these other steps that you don't anticipate being important, like being legally compliant, which just basically means that there's a nice little checklist you, you know, gave to the government that you're set up, and all these other little things. And so it's more on that end, but in regards to our technology, I'm not really concerned. Yeah, PCI compliance is a bitch. <laughs> you don't want to handle that, yeah. unless you are really need to make that your core thing. Work with someone who handles your PCI compliance. Um, I was going to say, for us, it's an interesting concern actually around big tech um, becoming the problem. So they're kind of like government, I guess, if you go back to the Googles and Facebooks of the world. But the closed um, architectures of the marketplaces that we're building today and the app stores and things like that um, really scare me. Because uh, I think they have control over um, way too much informational as well as uh, distribution for where we're going. It's one of the reasons why we continue to be uh, big believers in the web, even though the apps are a valuable space for us, because uh, the web is a little more uh, free and independent. We're also a content company that competes with the biggest uh, entertainment and media companies in the world, and they love squashing little people who are trying to do interesting things with business models. Um, so, love seeing the changes that are happening for uh, distribution and how easier it is to get to customers in today's world, but also get really scared about Comcast turning off the last mile or um, going after charging everyone what they're charging Netflix. Or Netflix. Or Google. All right, thank you so much for joining us today. Let's give a hand for Visit appalliance.org to access resources and join a global network of developers.